Friday, the last Outrider here, bringing you part three of Glasgow's origin story. This time, we're going to go over the great green visions. Personally, I think this means he's a pothead, you know, because, you know, orcs, orcs are green, and there, there might even be a weed. I'm, I'm, have you ever tried smoking orc? Me neither. But it could explain a lot. Uh, also, I'm going to embellish a little bit of this because, quite honestly, anybody who wants to read orc narration and doesn't swear a little bit is just not orky in my book. So, <clears throat> the Great Green Visions. Grazkal came out of his haze, see what I mean? Haze? Immediately after Mad Doc Gratznik performed his pivotal operation. That he awoke at all was a surprise to both parties. For Gratznik had replaced part of the goth warrior's skull, brain, with bionics and squig guts, holding it all in place by riveting on an adamantium plate. More amazement followed. Grazkal could see more clearly than he ever had before. This had little to do with his eyesight or new bionic eye, which truthfully was always a little bit out of focus. Rather, for the first time in his short life, Grazkal woke with a brand new vision. It was his destiny to rally all of Orkdom and to lead them on the greatest wag of all time. It was now his belief that he was in direct contact with Gork, Mork, and my personal favorite, Bork, the great green gods of the orcs. And Glasgow realized that he had been chosen as the living embodiment of their divine wishes. They wanted him to lead the way towards the greatest battles in the galaxy. The first to fall beneath Gradskull's iron-shod heel was a Death Skull's warlord by the name of Dreadmech. Grazkal had just emerged from Mad Duck's grimy tent and was still rubbing his shiny adamantium-plated head when Dreadmech approached. Striding down the street that ran between the corrugated shacks of the derelict, derelict Death Skull's outpost, Dreadmech demanded to know what a goth was doing within the boundaries of Rust Spike. Behind Dreadmech, his entourage of knobs guffawed, anticipating a bit of sport. Undaunted by the massive, cobbled together combi weapon that the Death Skull's warlord was waving in his direction, Graz Skull advanced. Knobby fists clenched. Dreadmech, expecting exactly such a move from a goth, promptly opened fire. Every barrel of his custom weapon began to blaze. The air was filled with flying projectiles, and the flashing of half a dozen gun muzzles emitted blinding strobes of light. Perhaps it was a sign from Gork, or possibly Mork, or maybe Bork, a stroke of divine intervention to save their prophet. As although the explosions blossomed at his feet, and bullets stitched patterns alongside him, Grazkal advanced untouched. The only sounds were the last spent shells clattering to the ground, and the spinning whir 
of empty ammo hoppers. Also, there were a few desperate uh, trigger clicks in the background. The heavy tread of iron boots and finally a rusty squeak as Dreadmech's iron jaw fell open. So savage was the pummeling that Grasgull delivered with his bare fists that the Dreadmech's mobs cheered despite themselves. The final headbutt delivered from Grasgull's newly armored skull finished the job with a resounding clang. Straddling the pulped body of his foe, Glasgow announced that this was the only the beginning. He bellowed to the gaping onlookers that he was the prophet of Gork and Mork and possibly Gork, Bork. And furthermore, his bull voice roared that if anyone was looking for some of the devastation he had just delivered on their former warlord, that they could step the fuck up one at a time or rush him together. He could give a shit. After another hour of solid fighting, a battle in which Grasgall did not himself take any more than a scratch, he had taken over as rightful ruler of Rust Spike. Though it was hard to see much with their bruised and fucked up faces, it seemed to his new followers that Grasgall grew larger before their very eyes. Irk, united. Give me a second. <clears throat> by crushing the tribes within reach of his new stronghold, Grasgull began to increase his horde. In addition to the Duskulls that had followed Dredmek, there was now several goth mobs beneath the young warlord. As tales of Grasgull's deeds circulated through the scrap heap villages and makeshift fortresses of Urk, Orcs began to leave their tribes and head to Rust Spike, looking to be a part of something bigger than their own dismal warbands, fighting over the same old scrap. They wished to go to war with this new boss who claimed to talk to Gork, Mork, and Bork directly, who asserted that one day... <coughs> they would find richer targets. Soon, Rustbike grew too overcrowded. That was impossible to spit and hit the ground without hitting an orc. So, Grasgull went west. It was on the cracked plains of the Big Wasteland that Grasgull met his first setback. He had entered the territory of the Bad Moons, the richest and most envied of the local clans. The Bad Moons leader was a war boss named Snazdaka, and none could match the mix of firepower and mobility that his bright yellow battle wagon brigade could muster. When Snazdaka saw Glasgow's hordes marching across his lands, he ordered his totem pole raised. This actually was a surprise because I didn't know orcs had those, much less that they needed help raising them. But, hey, new fluff. Faster than a runt herd could throttle a wayward grot, the tribe was on the move. 
In the running skirmishes that followed, Snaz Daka and his boys were always able to lob a few shells into Grazkal's horde before driving off out of range of retaliation. Grazkal had already proven his superior brawling skills by overpowering, bludgeoning, and generally beating the shit out of all who dared challenge or defy him. Now, however, he was engaged in a battle of wits and tactics. Here, too, the up-and-coming warlord would display not just his superiority, but the kind of brutal showmanship that makes orcs punch their fists into the air and raise raucous cheers of FUCK YEAH! Within days, Glasgow unleashed a number of countermeasures, any one of which would have proved too much for the bad moons to overcome. He had his lads sabotage the supply dumps where Snaz Daka refueled his battle wagons. Glasgow then gauged the win and ordered several shanty towns put to the torch. The thick, acrid smoke drifted over the cracked plains, hiding the exact whereabouts of his troops' movements and making it impossible for the bad moons to flee until Glasgow's infantry was right on top of them. Most impressively, Glasgow had coerced the fastest orc on Urk to join him by outracing him in a one-on-one -on -one duel of speed. All who saw it agreed that only the divine might of Gork and Mork and Bork could have allowed the now hulking golf warlord to outpace grand speed boss Snazfrag of the Evil Sons. Each and every one of Glasgow's tactics worked, wearing down the bad moons so that their defeat was inevitable. As the humbled Snazdaka watched, Glasgow ordered the bad moon mechs to fashion an enormous power claw from the rubble of their ruined tanks. So did all the bad moons on the planet fall into line. So large had Gazkull's horde grown that no war ban on Urk could hope to stand before his sweeping onslaught. Only the foolish or the stubborn even attempted to stand apart from the meteoric rise of this great green-skinned champion. One such stubborn fuck was a snakebite war boss called Grudblog. It took a long, bloody week to subdue the snakebites under Grudblog, and Graskull was forced to decapitate this motherfucker twice before the monster finally submitted to his loyalty. Think about that. Yeah, they wrote that. I didn't write that. They wrote that. You try to figure out what the fuck that means. When challenged to a headbutting contest by the hulking golf champion Urgrak, Glasgow was like a pile driver, sinking this motherfucker a full foot into the ground and knocking him unconscious with a single headbutt. Urgrak's knobs mob was so stunned that their undefeated leader had lost that they did not see Glasgow coming. In a fury, Glasgow worked his way through the knobs, leaving each one senseless. When the heads of Urdok and his knobs finally cleared, they were quite sensibly pledged their eternal allegiance to Glasgow. Battles of attrition had raged across the surface of Urk for nearly 8,000 years. 
with small tribes continuously rising and falling, each time battering themselves and those around them into submission. No great leader had ever emerged from the endless cycle of destruction. None could unite the tribes until now. The fuck you finger of fate. It took six years for Grazkol to finally subjugate Urk. Now grown larger than any warlord ever seen on the planet, he basked in his dominion, inspired by the spirits of the rising Wag and Grazkal's impassioned speeches about conquering the stars, the orcs swarmed about the planet's surface in a flurry of activity. A smattering of ramshackle ships began to arrive as orcs from across the Zornian system felt the siren call and hastened to join his war band. For the first time, Groups of mechs worked together, building in ways never completed before. Never before had they been able to mass their squalid resources, but now all of the scrap heaps were as one. Crazed energies flowed as they cobbled together vast battle fortresses, new weapons, and towering engines of fuck you or destruction. All of Urk's greenskins moved with a sense of destiny, an overflowing realization of their duty, their very purpose of being. And then the sun flickered. All the greenskins looked up at the suddenly dimming sun that had always lit the planet of Urk. All save Grazkal himself were scared shitless. The superstitious orcs dropped their weapons and spanners and stared upwards, slack-jawed at the wonder of this celestial phenomenon. The sun flared, blazed, and once more its rays blinked. In his booming voice, Grazkal assured the quavering greenskins that this was a sign from Gork and Mork, and Bork, it was telling them that it was time to leave Urk behind. That it was time for the galaxy to feel the might of the growing Wag. Even as the warlord spoke, a lone beam of green-tinted light illuminated the prophet of the great green gods. He told his followers to stockpile all the arms and ammunition they could find for they were leaving within the week. As there were few operating aircraft on Urk, and the mechs had only just started to construct more, some greenskins wondered, How the fuck are you going to do this, asshole? Well, a single glare from Grazkol, however, was enough to silence their questions, and instill within them, if not confidence, then at least a fear of asking how any such thing was going to be accomplished. The next day brought no dawn. In this case, however, this had nothing to do with the strange behavior of Earth's sun. The warp currents had changed yet again, reverting to patterns similar to those of thousands of years ago when the system had been a center of warp travel. As the tides of the warp roiled and twisted, they had also deposited an enormous space hulk into real space, vomiting forth the conglomerate craft into the Zornian system. The hulk now drifted in Urk's orbit, blocking out the light from the flickering sun. I know that was a long one, but I didn't want to break that in half into two 10-minute segments because it just seemed too, too, too seamless together. Next time, part four, The Exodus. See you then!
Bye!